Hey, folks, and welcome to uh, our final batch of sessions uh, to, at today's CCUF International Fair. Uh, we, my name is Logan Bright here with CCUF, uh, and I am joined by our guest of honor today, uh, Danny Zaretsky from SUAC. Uh, the Canadian University Application Centre. He's going to speak to everything you need to know to study abroad uh, here in Canada as an international student. Uh, I will be monitoring the chat and helping out with some Q&A as we go. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat box and we'll try to address as many as we can. Uh, otherwise, thanks very much for taking the time to join us here. And uh, Danny, thanks to you for your expertise and your time as well. Uh, feel free to take it away. Great, thanks so much, Logan. Welcome everyone from wherever you are in the world. Uh, I hope the very primary thing you get out of this session is a feeling of confidence that you're getting accurate information and you have some guidance as to how to chart your course, how to develop your pathway either towards studying in Canada or making a decision that Canada perhaps is not the right uh, option for you. So I want to, uh, oops, I want to just um, talk a little bit about, uh, I've just got to go back here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the CUAC itself and how we got started. Um, really, uh, it was from myself and a colleague back in the mid-1990s. I know uh, that is a long, uh, a long time ago for most of you, that... Uh, we were, we were traveling abroad and we saw that there was a lot of uh, inaccurate information. Oh, I think it skipped again. Um, so we decided to uh, really launch an organization that would give accurate information to international students worldwide and give them a, a reliable basis to be making their decisions. So... Uh, as a result, we launched our first office in Bangladesh. And uh, after that, we expanded throughout South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and ultimately into South America. We're, uh, I believe, the only uh, officially recognized organization that does this in Canada. And by that, I mean there was a national report of our universities organization. All universities in Canada belong to it. And it made a report to Immigration Canada, the organization that decides on study visas, study permits, and it recognized us as following uh, very proper practices in international student recruitment. If uh, at any time any of you would like a free review, and we can tell you very plainly whether we think we can help you, you'll, you'll find forms on our website, cuac.ca. I strongly advise you to subscribe to our blog. You see the uh, link there, forward slash blog. You'll get all kinds of interesting information there, updates to study permit issues or post-graduation work permits, aspects to Canadian culture or how to choose a university. Uh, a recent blog we did uh, just this week was on studying in, in Nova Scotia and in Halifax and how that region is really developing, not only attracting international students, but people from all over Canada seeking to move to Nova Scotia for reasons you'll read in the blog. We're, we're also on Instagram and Facebook. And I'll just mention here, our, our own next uh, study fair is on January 28, next Friday. So feel free to register for that as well. So now we come to the why choose Canada part, or you can also think of it as why not choose Canada. The really core issues for choosing Canada as a whole start with quality. Canada is a very highly regulated environment and it's not, it's not easy for a, a university or, or a public college certainly to, um, to have its license and maintain it. Some of our fields like engineering are extremely, extremely regulated. So there's constant pressure on the programs uh, to satisfy the requirements. Uh, 
But I, I want to give you some wider understanding so you'll know why the quality is like that. Canada has 10 provinces and three territories, and all universities and colleges are regulated by them, not the federal government, not the national government. And there are three types of institutions, basically. There are others, but these are the three uh, prominent ones. Universities, which give out almost uh, always degrees, sometimes diplomas, bachelors, masters, PhD, colleges, and by here I'm referring to publicly funded colleges, uh, and polytechnics, which are very similar to publicly funded colleges in the way that they try to train people in a very applied way, like very specifically for careers. There are also private colleges, which do a very wide range of different training, uh, too much to try to generalize. So one key aspect that's important to understand is uh, when students finish high school in Canada, it's truly nearly 100% that are going to, it, if they're going to a university or, or a college to do a diploma, it's nearly 100% they're doing it at a public, publicly funded uh, institution, funded either, yeah, either by the province or the territory. So this shows how Canada is a very socialized country with a lot of control over, over something as fundamental as education. And through this system funded by taxpayers, the tuition prices are kept reasonably low. Canadians always want them lower, but they're reasonably low. And so this is a real strength in Canada. Another example is our public health system. So it may surprise and probably will surprise most of you listening that we don't have a private system for, for health. If, if you want, if you want uh, to see a doctor or you need surgery, maybe you need multiple surgeries, this is all through a public system. Canadians don't have an option to go to a private system. Uh, it's completely public. And we also don't pay for it. It's paid through our taxes. So we pay for it through our taxes. But if you happen to be a student and you're not earning much money and you're not paying any taxes, even as a Canadian student, you still have nothing to pay. You, you're not going to be asked to pay whether you have five surgeries or 20. So it's an example of an unusual country uh, which is socialized. There aren't many in the world. Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Netherlands are some examples. Uh, Australia very significantly and New Zealand. America, um, not, not nearly in the same way. So uh, apart from this strength of our education quality, there are aspects of Canadian culture that you might not be aware of. Uh, for example, we're a country that has many, many dozens of indigenous uh, tribal nations. Uh, before Europeans came, they were, they were nations here uh, speaking a wide range of languages. Uh, settlers came principally from England and France. And something that distinguishes us in North America is English and French are official national languages. And in several provinces, they're also provincial languages. I'm here in Toronto, Ontario, and, and anyone can get any government service from Ontario in English or French, whether they want to study in English or French or get uh, medical care in English or French or otherwise. So whether it's a national service or a provincial service, we can get it in English or French. And then quite significantly, we are really amazingly multicultural and multilingual in terms of uh, the origins of the people. So in, in my city of Toronto, for example, it, easily 50 languages would be taught in our school system. Could be everything from Punjabi to Vietnamese, Mandarin, uh, perhaps Yoruba. It's a very huge range. And if you want a statistic to really understand, um, in my own city here in Toronto, 50% of, of people living here were not born in Canada. So 
the significance for you as an international student is when you come to Canada, first of all, uh, if you have strong curiosity, you'll find it extremely fascinating. You will not know who is a Canadian citizen passport holder and who isn't. And no, moreover, we Canadians won't know either about you. You, you might uh, well step off the plane and, you know, most people are going to think you're, you're a Canadian. So there's a scope to really fit in. That, that's a strength. And then, of course, long-term opportunities. Uh, if, you, if you stay around uh, later on in the presentation, you'll hear more about uh, the options to work after graduation and even pursue permanent residence and finally citizenship after that. But I do want to talk uh, at least for a moment about uh, possible reasons why not to choose Canada. A uh, very fundamental factor could be that it's too costly. Although tuitions are kept relatively low for Canadians, that's controlled by the uh, governments. But for international students, it's wide open. So you may find a bachelor, uh, a bachelor degree in psychology right across Canada. Almost any university you check out, the price for Canadians is going to be somewhere around $8,000 Canadian funds uh, per year, two semesters. But if you check the international price, it's going to largely range from $15,000 to $50,000. And that's because there's no restrictions on what international students are, are charged. So uh, certainly institutions in bigger cities, they, they may have a lot of uh, prominence being large research universities. They will tend to charge more. But the, the quality aspect is fairly uh, consistent. So uh, no matter what you're pursuing, cost is a starting point. You have to see if it's realistic, uh, whether you can afford the tuitions in Canada, as well as the cost of living. Then there, there, there may not be the right program for you. Uh, for example, for those of you interested in uh, master degree programs, you may know getting into a thesis-based program is extremely difficult. And if you want a course-based program, well, there isn't nearly the choice in Canada that you will find in Australia or the United Kingdom, for instance. And then, of course, there could be a question of academic eligibility or admissibility. There are many programs in Canada, even their, their, um, you, they're academically possible, like let's say Master of Public Health, which is something very hot now with the pandemic, but very few spaces are offered and the competitiveness is quite tremendous. You could be an A student and still commonly get refused. And as well, there's the very real possibility that you're interested in something uh, that doesn't fit with Canada. So most of the world, when you finish high school and you want to apply to law school to become a lawyer, to medical school to become a doctor, uh, you do so right after high school, not in Canada, not in the United States uh, either for the most part. In Canada, you'd need to, in almost all cases, do a first degree in order to pursue those professions. So those are some reasons why Canada may not be the right choice for you. Now, uh, an issue that comes up is, should I uh, work with an education organization or not? Um, and of course, you may also come across, depending on where you live and what the marketplace is like, uh, immigration consultancies. So in terms of, first of all, making that decision, uh, I would say you should do it yourself if you can't find a party trustworthy and knowledgeable. Be, be very careful about using uh, an organization that you don't really know well if they know what they're doing or if also they're honest because the, the blunt fact in our field in, you know, in international student recruitment is there's a lot of faking going on. And in particular, if a representative did anything fake, it could be very bad for you as a student because uh, the Canadian government will have the perception that you could be responsible 
uh, for that. Uh, also hesitate about if it's an immigration consultancy. For Canada, it has to be licensed. There's a licensing process for that. And you should ask for proof of that. And you should be able to uh, confirm that on the licensing organization's website to see that the name is there and it's licensed. But still also um, have some care because organizations that do both education advising and immigration consultancy may do neither well or they may be mixing um, what they're advising you and not guiding you properly. So just be very careful. The, the advantages, I've spoken about some of the cautions, the advantages are that there can be many, many complications and a sophisticated organization can really guide you through, the, through those as well as just making smart decisions. You know, you have to start with your budget uh, as well as your academic goals or hopes or aspirations and try to find the right match for that, the right quality, the right technical program that suits your interests. All of that is very difficult to do on your own and organizations that have a lot of expertise can very readily tell you what to completely forget about and what to focus on. So I know uh, money, is a, money is a big reason why you and the audience are here to learn more about money. And so I wanna take you back to my opening comments about why I got started in this, why we launched the Canadian University Application Center. It's to give accurate information. So I'm not saying I'm giving pleasant information, uh, information that will make you happy. I'm just giving you information that is reliable, whether the news is good or not good. So let's start with an example of that. Uh, let's say you in the audience are interested in doing a, a bachelor degree in Canada, and you, you came to the CCUF event uh, looking for information on getting a full scholarship. Well, that is uh, nearly impossible. And if you don't have super top grades, like, you know, best in your class, outstanding, amazing, it's, it's pretty much impossible. These are very rarely given out in Canada. You, you will find it more common at uh, some US universities where they might give a full scholarship. Again, it will almost uh, always be for someone who's a, a superstar student or maybe a superstar athlete, a basketball player, football player, etc. cetera. So uh, I want you to be very cautious if you're you know, a B student, let alone a C student, and someone is saying, pay me money and I'll help you get a full scholarship to Canada, it's very unlikely there's any truth to that. So be very hesitant. If you are looking at a course-based master degree, that means one where you don't need a, a professor to supervise your master degree, there may be small scholarships, again, probably nothing, but there may be small scholarships that might cover 5% or 10% of the total tuition. If you are getting an offer to uh, a master or PhD degree to do a thesis under a professor, congratulations, it's extremely difficult to get. But if you get it, certainly if it's in sciences or engineering in Canada, the professor will be able to pay you to help with teaching and research, and it will likely cover most or quite possibly your entire budget. For postgraduate diplomas, quite unlikely you'll get much in the way of scholarships, but there are some private, uh, privately offered postgraduate diplomas which can give a significant award that might help with 10, 20, or 30% of the amount. The cost of living, like in any country, it ranges uh, from uh, bigger cities to smaller cities. That doesn't mean every smaller city is less costly. Some can be quite costly in, in Canada. There, you know, generally speaking, Toronto's considered 
uh, an extremely expensive city. So is Vancouver. But Montreal, which is our number two largest city, is not considered an expensive city, just to, uh, to give you that range. So that's something uh, you also have to look into. And uh, there, there is also considerable scope to earn money in Canada. If you get a study permit, it automatically comes with, with a work permit. So as soon as you arrive, basically, you can be looking for jobs. And Canadian universities and colleges are terrific at helping international students. They have offices to uh, show you where job postings are. They'll help you with your CV, your curriculum vitae. Uh, they'll prepare you for interviews. They'll give you a lot of support. You're able to work on campus or off campus. While you're a full-time student, and you must be a full-time student if you're getting a study permit, you can work up to 20 hours a year. I mean, sorry, 20 hours a week. Um, it's very unusual to be able to handle that. So it might be more realistic for you to do five or 10 hours a week and see if you can manage your course load before taking on more because uh, university or college studies uh, they are quite demanding. There's a lot of homework and assignments you get at all at all times. But if there's a summer recess, and there usually is from May to August, that's about 17 weeks where you have unlimited scope to work. You can take multiple jobs. You can be working, you know, all the time and saving all the money you possibly can, which, by the way, is a strategy Canadian students do as well, that they are you know, in almost all cases, working in our summers. Moreover, if you're a, a bachelor degree student, especially in engineering, computer, computer science business, and in some universities, a very wide range of fields, there's something called co-op, uh, which is a cooperation between the institution and the private sector, enterprises, businesses, and even government offices, where as part of the, the degree, a student might get over the course of a little over four years, not only a four-year degree, but eight, 12, 16 months of paid work experience related to the degree. That is not only prestigious, not only valuable experience, but very lucrative. These jobs pay quite well. These are not minimum wage jobs. To give you an idea, it wouldn't be at all unusual to get a job that on an annual basis paid $35,000 or $40,000 Canadian. So if you were working four months, you might well be earning $12,000, $13,000 or more, especially as a third or fourth year student, you might be uh, in a position where it's quite sophisticated. And of course, the companies that participate in this, they do it also with an eye to the future, maybe offering you a permanent job after graduation. Logan, are there any questions we should address uh, at this moment? I mean, there certainly are questions. Uh, the big one or one that we constantly get, and you alluded to this already, but couldn't hurt to hammer it home, uh, is the, the notion of the full ride scholarship, right? Uh, can students expect that? Uh, yeah, how, how, how are they going to get a, a full ride if possible? Yeah, so, you know, I can, I can emphasize that. And it's really to say, uh, don't get stuck on Canada. You, you know, Canada is not going to be the right answer for everybody in every situation. Obviously, you know, Logan and I are here as Canadians, products of our system. We believe in it and we definitely think it should be an option you consider. But it doesn't fit every profile. And I gave a number of examples earlier, uh, the profiles for whom it might not, pit, might not fit. Uh, so you need to be able to look at other options. There are lower cost options, Malaysia, Cyprus, China. There are different options out there that might possibly be affordable. Even sometimes they might give uh, full scholarships to exceptional students. Uh, so you need to expand your view. 
But you also have to do something no one else can do for you and have a realistic evaluation of your own profile. If you were only an ordinary student in your own country, is it realistic that any institution anywhere in the world is going to fully fund you? You have to go through that evaluation and perhaps also see how you can enhance your profile locally within your, within your own environment before uh, looking to study abroad. So it's really important to, to have a very clear idea of what's realistic. Thanks for that, Tom. Awesome response, Danny. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, a message that I don't think can ever be stated too loudly. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the topic of scholarships, uh, when do you have any recommendations for when students should apply? Uh, should they be starting in grade 10, 11, 12? Should they be waiting until they're enrolled or in Canada? Uh, when it comes to scholarships, yeah, when, when should students be digging in? So it's a, it's a great question, actually, Logan. Uh, not grade 10, not grade 11. If it's for bachelor degree programs at the time of application, when should you apply? Uh, ideally, well in advance. So for the September intake, uh, one can be applying October, November, any time after that. Uh, for the January intake, because some Canadian universities offer a January intake, that could be uh, in March, April, or any time after that. There are different scenarios, however, to consider, and it's a good example of why an, uh, a sophisticated uh, education advising organization can help a lot. For example, some, some uh, universities will only consider offering a scholarship if the student already has final grades. Others will consider offering it if the student has interim grades, if she has just finished the first or second of three semesters, for example, they may make a scholarship offer. Some may make that conditional only if you keep up the grades. And if you don't keep up the grades, you'll lose the award. Others don't make it uh, conditional. Some institutions won't make their scholarship decisions until March because they like to make it when they decide for Canadians and they want to see who are all the best students who applied, not just who, are, who has been the best up to a certain point in time. And finally, there are general scholarships available to everybody. And then there are some special scholarships that an institution might have that might only be decided once a year or twice a year and might require a special application process. So these are all uh, small details that are very difficult to understand even from uh, looking at five or 10 uh, you, you know, or more institution websites. That's where uh, organizations that really know what they're doing uh, can give very, very proper guidance. And, and again, almost all scholarships are academic. Uh, I do get asked a lot um, about extracurriculars, and that's because in the U.S. for their scholarship system, it's quite important. It's rarely very important in Canada. The importance of grades is generally speaking much more for Canadian institutions than for U.S. institutions. So uh, if, if one were applying to, say, Harvard or Yale, um, they, those institutions will want to know everything about the student, what she's been doing in her spare time, contributions, volunteering, all the rest of it. And in Canada, that's less common or there's less weight given to that. The, the biggest weight is actually on the grades the student has been getting. Appreciate that uh, context, Denny. And, and you've actually sort of answered an another question too. So I put it on the screen as you were speaking. So that's great. Uh, okay, so, and you've sort of alluded to another question a student had, uh, which was being able to ID uh, you know, an immigration company or an agent uh, for legitimacy, reliability, right? How are students, how, how, do, how do they make that decision? Is there a, a website they can check integrity? Uh, how, how do they do it? 
There is, there's, a, there's an immigration consultants um, website. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, email me, they can, they can do so at uh, studyincanada at cuac.ca. But basically, uh, it's a great question. Uh, what's the strategy? The strategy is uh, Mr. or Ms. Immigration Consultant, can you please give me your registration license number with the with the licensing body for immigration consultants of Canada, and the, and advise me how I can verify it. And if you're not getting a direct answer to that, then walk away. Uh, I also want to add, uh, lawyers are exceedingly trained. The requirements to be an immigration consultant are not nearly as high as to become a lawyer and focus on immigration matters. To become a lawyer in Canada, one generally will have completed a bachelor degree, then gone to law school, written uh, very rigorous uh, entrance exams, as well as articled with a law firm. So it's also possible to check if one is actually a lawyer because people may lie about that. And, and again, you can ask the individual, which provincial law society are you licensed in? There are 10 provinces. Each one keeps its own records. And uh, ask for that registration information and, and how to verify it because uh, there are offices set up to do exactly that. They'll be very happy to uh, confirm or otherwise, if you're telling them so-and-so has told me that she is a, a licensed lawyer in the province of Manitoba. That's uh, not, not complicated to double check it. And if the person's you know, uh, not able to give you an immediate confirmation of that, again, just, just walk away. But uh, as a general guideline, a, a Canadian lawyer is uh, quite competent, quite well, well educated. Thanks for that uh, really practical advice. Uh, perfect uh, for somebody here's what to do, right? That, that, that's really valuable, I think. Yeah. Uh, okay, so lots more questions, folks. We have, you know, some more time, maybe 15 more minutes. So if anyone has more questions, fire them into the chat. Uh, here's another one more broadly about Canada as a whole. Um, can you tell us about how Canada views diversity and maybe multiculturalism, uh, what, what that is like in Canada? Yeah, I, I, I love that question. Uh, I get asked it a lot. It's very important. And I, I like to start off by saying we have our flaws in Canada. We are a work in progress and there's lots to still uh, keep pushing uh, in terms of Canadian society. All of that being said, and I say it, uh, yes, as a Canadian, so maybe I'm biased or somewhat chauvinistic, but I am a Canadian who's traveled to uh, really countless countries around the world. Uh, and I think Canada comes out exceedingly well in response to that country. There's um, uh, a very intense embracing of multiculturalism, multilinguality, um, an absence of caring what you, uh, what you look like or how you dress. Uh, uh, I really like the fact that in Canada there, there isn't an ex, you know, a very strong emphasis on socioeconomic backgrounds. A lot of countries, uh, wow, the socioeconomic status you're born into is one you will have difficulty to shake and it will affect your opportunities. You know, um, my grandparents uh, were, you know, my, my dad anyway, was raised in a very poor family, was able to take advantage of what I talked about earlier, Canadian high quality public education, you know, at very low cost and his time almost no cost. And get educated and, uh, and develop himself. And, and this is something that, that Canada does quite well. So uh, I think Canadians by and large uh, are extremely comfortable with differences. 
people can go to work in a sari, uh, uh, can you know dress with a, with a hijab. Uh, by and large, uh, accommodations are made in our police force so that Sikhs can wear turbans. And it goes far, far, far beyond that. Uh, it might surprise people. Uh, it surprises even my younger self because I grew up in a Canada where food was very ordinary, meat and potatoes. And now it's just so common. Uh, Canadians really have a strong appetite for spicy food, for food from you know all over Asia, Africa, South America, uh, as well as music, dance, and and other arts. So uh, if you have to choose from this planet, that's what you're restricted to. I think Canada is really one of the few most comfortable environments that someone from abroad can can enter into, not only to study, but ultimately to make a life, which, which brings me to the last slide, and we can still uh, have a few moments of questions after, and that is, uh, anyone who completes a certificate, diploma, or degree in Canada of at least six months will be eligible for a post-graduation work permit. It's called PGWP. The maximum PGWP is for three years. And for that, you have to have completed uh, a, a program that was two years uh, in length academically. Doesn't mean 24 months. Generally, two years of study for us is 16 months of of full-time study. So if your program is less than that, you'll get a shorter PGWP probably sometime in the, somewhere in the range of one or two years in, in most cases. Uh, during that time, sometimes even before graduation, you can apply for permanent status. So uh, if you've been here from the start of the presentation, you've learned Canada has 10 provinces. Uh, You've learned that education is a responsibility of provinces. Uh, immigration is a responsibility of the federal government. And these two systems work together so that the federal government has given each of the 10 provinces special immigration pathways to help them recruit international students. So Nova Scotia has one, British Columbia has one, Alberta has one. They all have special systems to suit their particular needs. So sometimes it's for master students in their final year, they're able to apply for permanent resident status. And there's no limit in terms of the number of streams you could apply in. You could apply for the Federal Express entry, and if you don't get that, you could apply for it another year, or at the same time apply for you know, the provincial Nova Scotia or Saskatchewan uh, programs or, or or anyone that you're eligible for. So uh, it somewhat relates to the prior question in terms of uh, how Canada handles diversity. And really, there's no stronger way for me to demonstrate its attitude than how aggressively it's out to recruit permanent Canadians from around the world. So in November of uh, 20. Uh, 19, I think it was, the Prime Minister announced uh, the desire to have, I think it was actually November 2020, uh, the Prime, Prime Minister, because of the pandemic, said Canada's after 1 million new Canadians in the next three years, 2022 to 2024. That's for a population that today is 38 million. So we, for a long, long time, we've been always targeting 1% of population as growth through through new immigration and with pr status permanent residence uh, within a three-year wait one would be eligible for citizenship status and there's been a movement to reduce that even to two years so you will find a society that sees international students as a real plus i think that's a, a very confident generalization that I can make. So over to you, Logan, for any any other interesting questions. Sure thing. Uh, thanks for, for noting that too. The big target is uh, pretty ambitious, I think, for Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I agree there. Uh, okay, so another question that we had uh, sort of pertains to the post-graduation. Uh, it's more a money matter thing. Um, Part-time 
wages. Uh, is it realistic to be able to cover your tuition by working part time as an international student, you know, 20 hours a, a week, maybe? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, no, uh, depending on what your tuition is, uh, as a guideline, I indicated for bachelor programs, tuition could be 15,000 to even 50,000, possibly more a year. The high end is uh, very high. Uh, for college polytechnic programs that I talked about, uh, there, there is commonly tuition around 15,000 a year. Some private diploma program options may be around 10,000 a year. So uh, if we're talking about only part-time jobs, the student, let's say from September to April, may earn 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And if she's achieving that, she's doing very well because there just isn't that much time. I'm not saying more isn't possible, but no student should count on that. And no one should advise a student that that's even likely, um, let alone certain. If one brings in the May to August option or the co-op option in bachelor degrees that I talked about, then it's very viable, very reasonable to think, although it's not sure, that you could earn 10, 12, $15,000 or more in that four month period. That's adding to anything you earned in the other eight months. So uh, from a budget planning standpoint, that's the best way I would lay it out. But I'd, but I'd add something more. You, when you're thinking about what's realistic before you take the steps to follow the Canadian pathway, Understand that at some point you'll be applying for a study permit. Depending on the country you're in, there may be a special system. It's called SDS. It's only in 14 countries. There are some prominent ones, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, China, Senegal, Morocco, but it's not widely available. And so in most countries, there's going to be a lot more proofs of financial capacity than in those 14 countries uh, that I just uh, referred to and gave some examples of. So it, it's important to show a visa office that the family has enough money or the individual has enough money, even if no earnings are made from working because the visa office has no proof that the student will work. They, they can't, the visa office can't count on the student earning money. It's possible, it might even be likely, but they can't count on it. What they can count on are bank savings, income statements from you know, family members or other sponsors, other assets that show the money is there. So uh, that's very important. It's, it's one thing to have a plan that includes part-time and full-time work, but you also need a plan to show that the money is going to be there no matter what. So that, that can be through different means, including government loans, if those are available in your country. Thanks very much, Danny. Uh, we just have a few more minutes, folks. Uh, get your last minute questions in now uh, and we'll do our best to tackle them. Uh, Interesting question here from somebody, uh, their son finished high school five plus years ago, 2015. Is it still possible for the son to apply to a Canadian college or university or is it uh, too late for them? Yeah, so I'll introduce a new aspect for all of you in the audience that, that you need to consider. Something um, to help you understand your own personal context. So you're probably aware that uh, there are some countries in the world you can go to without a visa and others you can go to, you'll need, you'll need a visa as a visitor. That's true for me as a Canadian too. I can't just show up in, in India and get, it, get uh, admitted into the country. I have to apply for a visa. So if you're from a country where you need a visa to come visit Canada, then it will be more strict on you to also apply for a study permit. That's a very general 
guideline to think about. So when it comes to the specific question of being out of school for you know five, six, seven years, as the case may be, it's more of an issue if you're in a country where the individual would need a visa if she just wanted to go as a visitor. And the reason it's an issue at all is because there's a, there's a question there of why now? If you weren't serious about higher education on graduation, why now? And so the answer to the question ultimately is a maybe. Maybe you can pursue a degree or diploma, but you have to very persuasively explain what happened in the preceding three, four, five, seven years, or however long it was. Was it an issue of lack of finances, but now the finances are there, or medical issues? Or there were, there were some studies that were pursued, but something transpired, uh, maybe an issue in the family or uh, civil unrest in the country that, that uh, stopped the plans that, that were in place. So um, the, the really good advice I can give is if you're getting that far and you're applying for a study permit, don't leave that um, issue out of your application. Deal with it very directly. Yes, I know I left high school at such and such a time. Uh, this is everything I've been doing with my life since. The, these are the reasons why I didn't pursue further study or didn't pursue further study abroad. And uh, here is my explanation as to why now is the right time and why I'm very excited to uh, be pursuing higher study in Canada. That's interesting. A lot to, to think about there. Uh, I hope that helps um, for yourself and your son, uh, for the person who asked that question. Uh, we are a bit over time. We'll kind of, we'll go a few more minutes uh, and, and push it uh, to try to get a couple of more questions. Uh, this is an interesting one. It's from a student who is an international student in the States, uh, thinking about transferring to Canada. Is that uh, common? Is it doable? Is it uh, more or less impossible? Do you have any insight? Sure, well, that's, uh, that's a really fascinating question and uh, it may well catch others in the audience uh, quite interested. So let me just make a, a basic differentiation. If, if we're talking about transferring from a master degree to a master degree, that's very complicated. That, that is something that in certain circumstances might be possible, but they will be rare. If we're talking about transferring from a bachelor degree to a bachelor degree, that is very possible. Uh, I would only exclude something like engineering or largely exclude it because it's very complex. Canadian engineering programs are very strictly regulated and it's, uh, most unlikely that a, an engineering degree started abroad will be similar enough to a Canadian one. But if it's in uh, psychology, IT, bioscience, pretty much anything else, it's very viable, particularly if you are trying to transfer after one year or maximum two years. Canadian bachelor degrees are mainly four-year degrees, and it's most unusual that a university will give a degree if one didn't spend at least two years at the degree, at the institution for that degree. So um, if you're still within two years or even you might be in third year, but you are open to only transferring two years, then it's possible. And the way the process works is like this. You um, uh, would submit not only your ongoing transcript, but official course descriptions. And these are evaluated by the university one by one, along with the grades you had. And so if the course that you studied in, whether it was in the USA or Malawi or anywhere else, was similar enough to the course in the Canadian uh, university or to uh, even an, an elective option that the, the institution might give, maybe it's religion, and they don't have that particular course or philosophy, uh, but they can give you a philosophy credit for it. Uh, 
then as long as the grades are fine in each course, it's possible that up to 100% of two years of courses could be transferred. If the grades are mostly good, but there were some courses where the student did poorly in, then all the other courses will transfer, will get credit, except for those few where the grades weren't very good. And what's really interesting about the question as well um, is that in many, many countries, the systems of education at the university level are very restrictive, very narrow. For example, I've, I've traveled to Nigeria many countless times and it's just so difficult to not only, first of all, to get admitted into university, but to get admitted for what you want. And that's apart from the problem that even if you're admitted to what you want, you may not want it after one or two years where you realize what you're studying is not of interest to you. That's why Canadian universities have this co-op program I was talking about because a student gets to see, is accounting for me? Is psychology for me? I need to get some work experience to help know. So it's actually possible that you could be a second year science student and deciding you actually want to go do your major in psychology and you could make that shift in Canada. You could even make it in reverse. You could be a psychology student and you wanted science. Um, the, the only qualification or limit to it is maybe not all courses were transferred depending on how each university uh, prescribes the rules for getting a degree. So sometimes you might get two years transfer credit, but only one and a half would actually be useful because you wanted a bio, you know, a bioscience degree, but you were a psych student. So if you wanted psych, you'd get two years, but if you wanted bioscience, you'd get one and a half. So Canada actually has a tremendous options. No, no matter where you are from in the world, it's possible in Canada to achieve you know, your ac academic dream. You could be a literature student in any country in the world. And if you came to me and said, could I still be a doctor someday in Canada? I'd say, yes, you, you know, there's a pathway. It doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean it will happen, but in the country you're from, probably it's impossible. And in Canada, it won't be. Fantastic. Thanks, Danny. Uh, as I mentioned, folks, we are over time. Uh, I think we have just enough for one last sort of broad question uh, before we sign off. So, Danny, here is a student. I've applied to many universities but haven't received an offer letter. Uh, I don't know what they are really looking for among international students. Uh, if you could offer some insight into what schools really are, are looking for when they're applying, uh, you know, uh, reviewing applications, sending out letters, uh, that might be a, a good way to, to conclude. Sure. Well, uh, there could be two possible issues going on. It, it could be the institution uh, isn't organized uh, or hasn't yet arrived at the, the decision. It, it may be very well organized, but takes its time. Or it may be it has communicated the decision to you but you haven't received it. It might have. Uh, it might have been via email, and it went to your, you know, your spam box, or maybe a, an error was made in the email address, or maybe it was sent by some other means. So, I, I know that's a very uncomfortable situation to be in. It's another good example of uh, the kind of service that organizations like ours can provide to to make sure that just never happens because. There's a lot of anxiety associated with everything, including most certainly to know if you got an offer or not. What could happen is that the qualifications didn't satisfy the admission standard. That, that is possible. Um, and if, if because the person who asked the question didn't indicate if it was bachelor level or master level, for example, uh, master applications for sure can sit around for a very long time, even a year. And if the student is applying for a thesis program where a supervising professor is needed, nothing's going to happen with those applications. And it's most unlikely the university will even 
send any information to say, we got your application or, you know, it's going to take a long time to process it. Nothing will happen unless in most cases the, pro the professor actually is contacted by the student and agrees to make an offer to the student. So master cases, it is very common to have this situation happen. If it's bachelor cases or uh, diplomas, uh, it shouldn't happen very commonly. And I would uh, suggest to the student, if she's in that situation, to, to be pursuing it very directly. Find, find a contact online, phone or email, and uh, definitely ask, you know, indicate, indicate all the specifics, file number, your name, date of birth, uh, and and the date of application and say when when should I be getting an application because there are breakdowns in the system. So I, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Logan uh, in particular, but uh, more widely the, the CCUF. I think it's um, your organization is offering a great public service to students and their well wishers are abroad. That is something. Uh, that we at the Canadian University Application Center really value. And uh, we hope that whether uh, we've told you uh, only things that you wanted to hear or not, most, most likely it's been a mixture, that at least you've come away from, you know, the better part of an hour feeling like you learned about the realities of studying in Canada. Well, uh, Danny, very kind of you uh, to say, uh, but we couldn't couldn't do it without expertise uh, like yours. So thanks really for taking the time out today, uh, not once but twice to to share that expertise with uh, the audience. Great, thanks much. All right, uh, and thank you everybody for tuning in, attending. Uh, CCUF International is wrapping up for the day. Uh, hit some booths. There may still be some folks around. Otherwise, you can check out recorded presentations. Uh, over the next couple of months. So Danny, thanks again uh, for everybody at CCF International. Thanks for tuning in and joining us. We'll see you next time.